All right, um, so the projectors are working their way on. I'll just touch bases. I know you're all disappointed that this is our last lecture, right? that you're completely bummed out by the fact that we won't get to do this anymore this semester. I think, do I have, I think I have some of you. Julie, are you in any of my classes next fall? I don't, I can't remember. Mm -hmm. Nope. Okay. So I don't think I have any of you again next fall. So, bummer. Yeah. What's that? Yeah, next spring. I'll see some of you back next spring. All right. The bottom line is that we're going to finish covering Chapter 3 today, and we're going to talk about process capability, right? We talked about process control last Tuesday, which is the internal control of a process, and process capability compares how we do internally to what our customers want from us and to determines whether or not we're able to meet their specifications, okay? And it, <clears throat> the language... Um, you have in process control, you talk about the upper control limit and lower control limit. And something kind of um, similar in process capability, we talk about the upper specification and the lower specification limit. And I know when I get to talking quickly, sometimes I want to interchange those. So you, could, you feel free to go, no, we're talking capability, we're talking specification limits, not control limits, right? But that's something that you should strive and I strive to keep, keep separate. Um, <clears throat> and so then next week we're not going to have class. You're going to work on your projects and get those finished up and submitted. We'll come back then on the uh, during finals week and we'll do in-class presentations of your projects. Okay. Um, and then I'm going to make some communications with the folks online about what we're going to do for their projects. Um, so that being said, let's go ahead and roll into um, the Chapter 9 lecture. And I'm going to end the lecture today with kind of the exam review as well um, and so and we'll use that as our practice kind of problem for the homework as well okay so process capability is uh, where, what we're going to cover today and again I started to talk about control limits versus customer specifications so those control limits are the lower and upper ranges of the control band or the range in which that process consistently operates. So we're talking internal, right? And then customer specifications are the lower and upper range that the customer is willing to accept um, on the product or the product specifications, okay? And so when we start to think about that, our process capability is about the proportion of output that's within specs, okay? So what proportion actually meets what the customer wants? Okay. And so I think that the specs provided by the customer in this example were that they wanted um, 75 to 85, um, I think this is some tire pressure, some PSI uh, pressure per square inch, I think is what we're working with there. Um, and um, the lo so again, 85 would be the upper specification limit because it's the customer spec, right? And 75 would be the lower specification limit. So if you look at this process, right, here's the 85, here's the 75, and here's the actual mean of what we are able to do, right? So we can see that this could be a bit of a challenge for us, but we're not exactly sure how much, right? And so what we're able to do is kind of look at, well, how can we identify how much, okay? Um, <clears throat> so... Again, we know that our standard deviation is kind of that color is a little hard to read, but our standard deviation is 4.2, and that's supposed to be PSI. Um, and so um, <coughs> if we, so as we think about <coughs> how could we improve this process, what we would think about is one of the things is, well, can we shift the mean, right, of the current production process to match the mean of the customer specifications? And that in and of itself is going to give us opportunity to, to meet the customer's specifications more often. So that's typically the first thing you do is you try to shift the mean of your production to match the mean of your customer. The second thing that you try to do is then you try to s narrow up the variation that exists around that mean which in your process, which means then you're going to be able to meet even more. So for example, in this example, we shifted the mean um, to 80. Okay, which means that our probability of meeting the customer specifications is 0.766. Okay, and so again, here's the 
lower spec of the customer, the upper spec of the customer, and here's the pink is what we expect the process to be able to do. So I just want you to have kind of that visual look at how what we're doing changes how we're able to match those customer specifications. Okay, and then reducing that variation down to 2.5, again, increases our probability of meeting the customer specifications up to 95% probability. So we go from 68% in the top, where our mean is off-center and we have a wide standard variation, to 76% where our means match, and then if we narrow up that variation, we're able to get to 95%. So again, that's typically the steps you take, as you try to match the mean first and then reduce the amount of variation. Okay. All right, so example 9-7 in the textbook, um, and we're talking about this door, this proportion of doors that are falling within the specification limits, okay? And, and really, this is just an example. I don't think you're, I don't, in fact, I'm sure I'm not asking you to do any homework on it. I just want you to understand how this works with the normal distribution table, the normal distribution curve, okay? So if we were interested in finding out the number of doors that are going to fall within that range, right, we would say that that probability is the probability of doors that are greater than 75 and the probability of doors that are less than 85, right? And so if we were going to then look, use the probability curve, we'd say, well, what's the probability that the doors are going to fall in that range that's less than 85? And then we're going to subtract out what's then the probability that the doors are going to be less than 75. And that's going to leave us with that range under the curve that's between 75 and 85. So if we do that, we can use norms distribution in Excel. And we can input, we want to understand the probability of that the value is going to, the outcome is going to be um, under 85, right? So we're going to put 85 within the mean of the process is 82.5. The standard de deviation is 4.2. When you put in true and it tells us, okay, well then that's 72.4% probability that it's going to be less than 85. And on that same range, we can do it with 75 and we can put in, okay, 75, the mean, the standard deviation, and it tells us that it's a 37% probability it's going to be less than 75. So we take the difference between those those two and it tells us, okay, we have a 68% probability of meaning that our uh, the door making process is capable of producing within those specifications, right? So that's one way to get to that probability. And I and I do that because I want visually we should be you should be really understanding that normal distribution curve and how we're trying to what we're trying to do is look at customer specifications on that normal distribution curve and then look at process capability or process control on that normal distribution curve. Okay? Okay. So, there's an easier way to get there. Um, and uh, what we want to do is we want to, if, if we, we're going to look at two measures for process capability. One is called CP and one is called CPK. We use CP when our process mean matches the customer mean, okay? Because, um, and then we use CPK when the means aren't centered. <clears throat> so, <coughs> with the centered process, what we're saying is the difference between the upper specification limit and the mean and the lower specification limit and the mean are identical, right? So, again, our mean is centered with what the, our process mean is centered with what the specification mean is, okay? And so we look at that and we say, well, what we kind of verbally think of it as we're going to compare the voice of the customer to the voice of the process, okay? So on the top, we're going to put the voice of the customer. What's the range that the customer is comfortable with that we could deliver this product to them for? So we're going to take the upper specification limit minus the lower specification limit. And then on the bottom part, we're going to say, well, with six standard deviations, are we at, I think, 99.7%? I think with six standard deviations, I'd have to double check that math, right? But so that's the voice of the process. So we're going to take six standard deviations of what the process is and say, okay. So if I, so let's think about this for a little bit. Do we want the process range to be inside the customer specification limits or outside the customer specification limits? Do, do we want the, the range of our process to be inside the customer specification limits or outside the customer specification limits? 
So if our customer says, I want a product that's uh, plus or minus uh, an inch, right? So that gives me a two inch range, right? Do I want my process to be inside that range or outside that range? So I'm, I'm getting a little bit of both. So if I have this plus or minus an inch on either side, right? And my process is actually two inches outside of that. That means it's going to be outside the customer's specification. So that won't work. So the answer is inside, right? We need our process to our process range to be inside those customer specification limits. Okay. And so that being said, now we're saying is the voice of the customer. So we want that to be bigger than what we want our voice of the process to be. So. Are we hoping that our process capability is greater than one or less than one? So if the voice of the customer has to be larger than the voice of the process for it to be a capable process, or does that ratio need to be greater than one or less than one? You guys are not thinking very clearly this morning. I'm just going to hang out until you think. So. <laughs> greater than one. It needs to be greater than one, right? Because you want if that numerator is larger and the denominator is smaller, right? You're going to get you're going to get a number that's greater than one, okay? And I do that because I want you to understand it, not just okay, well it's greater than one or less than one, but why does that matter? And it's because we're comparing the voice of the customer to the voice of the process. And so at the very bottom here, we've got this list of um, process capability. Um, ratios, and then it's how many defects in terms of parts per million does that return, okay? And so if your process capability is less than one at 0.86, that means that you're going to have 10,000 parts per million in terms of errors, okay? If your process capability is considered one, which is just capable, meaning your voice of the customer and your voice of the process are equal to each other, you're saying that it's okay to have 3,000 errors per every million, right? And if you have your CP is actually 1.3, you're moving from 1,000 errors down to 100 errors, right? If your CP is 1.47, now you're 10 errors per million, right? So that's pretty impressive the higher up. And if you get to 2 on your CP, that means it's 2 parts per billion, right? So again, you say when we get to 1, we say the process is just capable. When we get below one, it's not capable. And when it's above one, we just say it's capable. Okay? So, again, just wanted to make sure that you have that understanding. Okay. Let's keep moving. So, if our means aren't centered, then we're going to use the measure called CPK. Okay? And CPK is the process capability ratio um, where we break out the upper specification limit and the lower space specification limit and just look at them separately, okay? And so rather than the, in CP, if you remember, we looked at six standard deviations as the voice of the process, right? If we're going to break those apart in CPK, we look at the upper specification to the mean divided by three standard deviations. And then we look at the mean minus the lower specification divided by three standard deviations. So all we're really doing is breaking CP into two parts here, right? And so we call that CPK. And your CPK then is the minimum of those two values, right? Because you're saying, well, let's just keep working with this then. So our example is that we have our upper specification limit is 85 uh, PSI. Our mean is 82.5. Right, and we say three standard deviations times the sta excuse me the z score of three times the standard deviation of 4.2, right? Tell, and if we run that calculation, it's going to be 0.1984, all right? And then on the flip side of that, 82.5 minus 75 divided by three times 4.2 gives us a CPK value of 0.5952. So we compare these two values. And we say, which is the smaller? And it's 0.1984, okay? And if I go back to our initial chart, that should make sense to us, right? Because of where the mean is at compared to the lower specification limit, 
right? That we have much more opportunity to be successful here than we do here, right? So the CPK value from the upper specification limit is going to be the one that actually we use to define the process capability, okay? So 0.1984, okay, so if that being the case, is the process capable or not capable? Yeah, no. not capable because it's less than one, right? Okay. All right. So with that centered process, right, we need that vo voice of the customer. We want it to be larger than the voice of the process, okay? And I've drawn this here because what we're saying is this is the voice of the customer, right? And our hope is that our voice of the process is going to be inside the, those ranges. So think of these as the upper specification, lower specification, and this is the range that we would want our process to be. If it's like this, right, here's our upper spec and lower spec from the customer, and this is what our process is going to do, we're going to be delivering all kinds of material that's going to be outside their specifications, okay? So again, I just want to make sure you're uh, thinking along those lines. Okay, so just kind of a review of control capability and design. Every process has variation in performance. Our question is, is it normal or abnormal, right? We don't want a process that... We don't want to tamper with a process that's in control or has normal variation, but we need to identify those processes that are out of control and identify the sources of abnormal variation. Okay? Control charts monitor processes to identify abnormal variation. Okay? Control charts can cause false alarms or missed signals by mistaking normal variation for abnormal variation. Okay? in terms of capability and design, we want to set up our processes so that they have local control for early detection, right? Because that's where you're going to fix it. You don't want to wait until you've produced a bunch of parts and then figure out you've got a problem. You want that, you want that process control to be right there on the production line so that people can make understand whether or not the process is in control or not. And if it's not, then stop it and figure out what they need to do, okay? And so, um, when you say a process is in control, all we're saying is it's, it's internally stable. We're not making any assumptions about whether or not we're going to be able to meet customer demand or not. We're just saying the process can run consistently. Okay? And then when we get to the capability side, that's when we say, okay, can the process that's in control actually do what the customer needs it to do? Okay? So can we meet those external customer needs? Improving process capability involves, and we talked about this earlier, shifting the mean in the short run, right? We want to get the mean to match the customer mean. And then in the long run, we try to reduce that variability, which oftentimes requires investment to be able to improve the production line. Okay? Um, <clears throat> we also have robust, simple, standard, mistake-proof design improves the process capability, and I've got a little bit more on that on the next slide. A joint early involvement in design by all improves product quality and speed, and again, I've got a little bit more on that, okay? Um, so process capability measures its precision in meeting those processing requirements. When we try to improve capability, we want to reduce the variation. You've heard me say that probably nine times in this lecture already, right? We want to match the mean and then reduce the variation, okay? Um, <clears throat> And again, that simplicity, standardization, and mistake proofing. Okay, so let's take those in kind of smaller chunks. Why would we say simplicity? So think of it like this. Fewer parts on a production line mean few, fewer choices and opportunities for error, right? <coughs> and so if we assume that every time we add a part or add a step to a process, we're introducing an opportunity for error. Does everybody agree? Every time we add a part, every time we add a new step to the process, we're introducing another opportunity for error. And actually, the, 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 it's an, an exponential, so it's the probability increases every time. So it's P to the N, however many parts or however many steps to the process. So if you simplify, you're exponen exponentially increasing your likelihood of success. Okay? And I'll give you the example when... Um, when I first started at Story City, we produced Proline windows for Lowe's that were brown, white, and tan, right? And there were three opportunities for error, right, on just the cladding, right? And so then we went from brown, white, and tan to 13 colors. Now there's 13 opportunities for error, 
right? And then we went from those 13 colors to you can have it any color you want, okay? Now there's a gazillion opportunities for error. And, you know, you can get, you can pick the wrong uh, cladding color. Um, and, and again, you don't realize as you're, I mean, it's a subtle creep, right? And so you have to decide, are you changing your strategic focus? Because simple, easy, and um, accurate versus more complex, less easy, you know, are you also going to increase your cost to the customer? Is your customer willing to pay for that, right? So you've got to make those choices as you're making those decisions. And it's easy to um, succumb to the pressure to say, okay, well, our customer wants everything, right, but does the customer want to pay for everything? Or do you have a sweet spot in the market that's your strategic spot and it's important for you to stay there? Or no, the strategic spot is being eroded, so we have to adjust and accommodate for that. But you should make conscious decisions about those things, okay? <clears throat> All right, um, standardization, um, using standard proven parts and procedures rem removes that operator discretion and decision making. Um, we started to, I mean, we just went to a gazillion SKU numbers at, at this ProLine plant. And in trying to explain to people why it mattered, we, we racked up how many different decisions we'd added to the operators on the production line. And so you can't continue to expect them to produce at the same level when they have exponentially more decisions to make on that. And they, they're not hard decisions. It's, okay, what color class, right? Okay, is this uh, left or right unit? Is this, a, you know, is it fixed or venting? Is it this? Is it this? But every one of those things requires them to stop and make a decision. Right? And so that, simple, that standardization in terms of using the same part reduces the amount of opportunity for error for them as well. Okay? Another approach is what we call mistake proofing. Um, a lot of what we do on the production line at Pella is if a part had to be oriented a certain way, we'd make kind of a collar that would, you couldn't put it in the wrong way. Right? Because that would be something that, like, if you, you think about you have a, a let's just say a style that's a side of a window, okay? And you have to shape the end of that style. Well, if you put it in backwards, right, and it's got a slope to it, then you've screwed up the part, right? So you make a collar that's flat on one side so that the back side that's flat has to go in that way. And that's mistake proofing. You're keeping your operators, if they try to put it in, it's, oh, wait, that doesn't work. Flip it back the other way and go, right? And you try to find as many of those types of things to uh, come up with to make, their, to make life um, simpler and, and help them uh, be successful, <clears throat> okay? And so um, when you do that, that reduces um, rework. Uh, and therefore reduces flow time, right, and processing cost. So, again, why those things are important. Um, and then the last thing that we talk about here is joint design and early involvement, right? And you may not think that that's such a big thing, um, but we talk about with that joint design, you're talking about robust design. And what we say, what we mean by robust design is that um, you design your product so that it is likely to be successful in, in a variety of environments, right? And so you design it so that it has a broader opportunity for success, okay? So that's when we talk about robust design. Integrated design, what we mean is you're bringing a whole group of people that are across different areas together to help with the design process. Um, so you're having your customers, your suppliers, your, your operations folks, right? Everybody's coming together to do that. And the reason that's so important is if um, the statistics tell us that 70 to 90% of product cost is locked in in the design phase, right? And so if you come up with a great idea later on, right, it's much harder to implement. And so incorporating that into the design phase is important. And above and beyond that even, 60 to 80% of product problems can be traced back to the design phase. Okay, so again, it's a critical stage and it's worth spending the time to get it right, okay? Um, <clears throat> so that's kind of our um, capability and design, uh, control, process control, process capability, kind of the overview for that. Do you guys have any questions about that chapter? Okay, what I thought we would do is go ahead and um, use the exam review 
uh, to review a couple of the problems uh, like you'll have to do for today. Um, and I was going to apologize to the on-campus folks. I think I had one of, I had 9C2 that was due today, yesterday, and it's actually with the lecture for today. So for those of you who went ahead and completed that, good job. You'll have one less to do for next week, right? But, um, <clears throat> all right. Review too. Um, so I'm just going to go through it in the same way uh, it's on the on our review here. So um, <coughs> and again, you know, I'm not very creative. So if you go through the problems here, you should be in pretty good shape for the exam, right? <coughs> and the other thing would be make sure, make sure that you know the terminology, right? And I think that multiple choice will go well for you as well. So I have I have trouble understanding. Because um, I feel like I've been pretty straightforward about that, and there's been p folks that haven't studied the Quizlet and been prepped for the terminology. So um, if you need to do well on the last exam, I'd really make sure that you focus on that. Okay? Um, and the problems. All right, so let's talk about conceptually. Um, this from chapter eight, if you remember, we talked about um, how different decisions affect waiting time. Okay? So the first example is a mail order firm has a total of 12 Watts lines coming in, okay? And they have five customer service reps. On average, two potential customers call every minute. Every customer service rep requires on average two minutes to serve a customer. On one of the days, two of the Watts lines happen to be down, okay? So we've got, we're going from 12 to 10, and as a result, only 10 Watts lines are available that day. So because of that, the proportion of potential sig customers getting a busy signal. Okay, and we're just going to start around the room, Troy. So the proportion of potential customers getting a busy signal. Increase, decrease, or remain unchanged? Increase. Increase. Everybody get that? Okay. Uh, Julie, the average waiting time that customers experience will increase, decrease, or remain unchanged? Uh, you can call a friend for help if you want. Um. Wouldn't it just remain unchanged? Actually, it doesn't remain unchanged. Okay, so it would um, increase then, right? Nope. Just kidding, decrease. <laughs> <laughs> so, so somebody help me out with the logic. Why would it decrease? If we go from 12 customer waiting lines to 10, right? If I get in on that 10th, if I, so before if I got in on the 12th one, I'd have to wait through 11 customers. Now I've lost two of them, so if I get in on the 10th one, I, I'm only going to have to wait through nine customers. Okay, so that's why, right? And it's important because the question that the questions on the exam aren't going to be identical to these questions. So you need to understand the rationale behind them, right? So again, when we because they're not necessarily intuitive. That one in particular is not necessarily intuitive. You have to think about well, what actually happens here? We go from 12 to 10, so now I don't have to wait as long. Okay, the average utilization of customer service then, Miranda. Does it increase, decrease, or remain unchanged? Um, so what happens to the customer service folks? So think about it from that perspective. So before they had 12 people that could wait for them online. Now they only have 10 people that can wait for them online. <coughs> what does that do to their utilization? It decreases? It does decrease it, but you didn't sound confident in that. <laughs> <laughs> And it decreases it because if you think about it, just it really affects kind of that not when the queue is full, right? But as the queue starts to empty out, they're missing two people out here that they normally would get to service, right? And now they're not going to get to service those two people because they never got into line, okay? Okay. <clears throat> A mail order company has one department taking customer orders and the other handling complaints. Currently, each department has a separate telephone number. Each department has seven Watts lines served by two customer service reps. Calls come into each department at the rate of one per minute. Each customer service representative takes an average of a minute and a half to serve a customer. 
A proposal has been put forward to merge the two departments and cross-train the two workers, or excuse me, cross-train the workers. The new department would, as a result, have 14 Watts lines served by four customer service reps. And as the operations manager, you know that, Abby, the proportion of callers getting a busy signal, will it increase, decrease, or remain unchanged? Nope. <laughs> yes. Okay. And so the logic behind that, so if you remember, we talked about variability, right? And when we separate variability out, we require, we talked about it from a safety stock perspective and we talked about it from this uh, customer waiting perspective. When you separate variation out, you have to have more safety stock over here, right? And when you combine variation up, then you have to have less, okay? But when we talk about it from a customer service standpoint, what it means is if I have the seven lines over here and seven lines over here, these lines over here could be really, really busy, and these lines over here could have nothing going on, right? And so they could actually have a problem with customers not being able to get in, and these people over here aren't busy. And so when we pull those two sources together and we're able to average that variability, right, um, that's going to mean that the customers that couldn't get in over here now have a better chance of getting into the system. Okay? All right. Austin. So if that's the case, the average utilization of customer service representatives will increase, decrease, or remain un unchanged. Well, I thought remain unchanged, but, but I don't you would think be that's incorrect. Right. Yeah. <laughs> okay. So why would it not be remain unchanged? Can any, anybody have the logic behind that? It goes right back to that example okay. that we were talking about here. Because before, these people yeah. could not even get into the system, and now they can get into the system. So if more people can get into the system, the, the utilization of those <laughs> service reps is going to increase. Okay. okay? Bless you. Okay? All right. Now we're going to get into the um, kind of how I have presented the Chapter 8 in the in the exam because we can't use the Excel part of it, right? So I'm going to ask you to fill it in as though you were filling in the spreadsheet, and then I'm going to give you the information that would would be an output from a different type of a problem, okay? So, <clears throat> um, Chelsea, we're going to hit you with the first one, So, and that's going to be how many servers there are, um, and then Khalid, you'll have what is the um, inflow rate, and... Uh, Blake, you'll have the processing rate, okay? So a catalog retailer has one customer service rep to take orders on an 800 telephone number. Assume for simplicity that any number of incoming calls can be put on hold and that nobody hangs up in frustration over a long wait. Suppose that on average one call comes in every three minutes and it takes the customer service rep an average of two minutes to take an order. The CSRs are paid $30 per hour and the telephone company charges $10 per hour for the 800 line. The company estimates that each minute a customer is kept on hold costs it four dollars in customer dissatisfaction. Okay, so Chelsea, how many how many servers? One. There you go. You had the easy one, didn't you? Everybody else is thinking, why didn't I get that? <laughs> okay, Khalid, what's the inflow rate? I think it's one over three. Yep, one customer every three minutes. Okay, so 0.33, repeating three. Okay, and then Blake, what's the processing rate? Any idea? Well, I'm, I'm trying to boil the numbers down. So basically when you're looking at the processing rate, you need to take one over the average time to process. So from that paragraph that I read, what was the average time to process? Was it three minutes? It was. So it's, excuse me, it was two minutes. Oh yeah, yeah. okay. Because it was three minute arrival okay. and yeah. two minutes for service. Okay, so it's going to be your your um, processing rate is going to be one customer every two minutes or 0.5 customers per minute. Okay, um, I was going to try to bring up the exam review problems here if I can find them. Okay, so we said one, we said one customer every three minutes. 
three sometimes with a three. <coughs> okay. And let me do... I was thinking there was an overrate button instead of insert. Maybe that'll do it. Okay. And then one over... Uh, so I would go one customer over two minutes, right? Okay. So using the performance.xls spreadsheet, um, Okay, so what I'm going to do is open that performance.xls spreadsheet. We're going to plug this in. In the actual exam, what I do is I give you a picture of another problem and say, calculate this information. Okay, so um, for example, let me open up that. Uh, do I need the infinite or the finite based on? So it says, assume for simplicity that any number of incoming calls can be put on hold. Infinite. Infinite, right? And we said our number of servers. Okay, let me close that. Come on. You can do it. So... We're saying we need one server. Our arrival rate is 0.333. I don't know. And our um, processing rate is 0.5, right? Mm -hmm. Okay. So then what I would do is I would give you a picture of this screen, right? And then ask you to do the next part with that, all right? And so if that's the case... I'm going to try to just bring this over here. This is the proportion of time that customer service reps will be busy. So what's the proportion of time that customer service reps will be busy? The utilization. Okay. Sixty-six point six percent. Okay. The average time that a customer will be on hold, and if you remember, we've got two sets of time and in inventory, right? We've got one set that's the waiting and one set that's the total, right? So if I'm saying what's the average time that a customer will be on hold, what is that? Waiting. Right. It's the 3.9. It's this one, right? And I think just to keep things simple, gosh darn it. Me and the computer are going to argue today. I think that's what I did. Yeah, I, I had three point, or I had the point three three. Okay. So that being said, we're saying proportion of time customer service reps will be busy is sixty six percent. The average time a customer will be on hold is basically three point nine minutes. The average number of customers on the lines is how much? 1.28, right? So again, the information about the waiting comes from this area. The information about the total process comes from this area. What does the difference between the inventory and the total system and the inventory waiting, what does that tell us? How many being served. How many people are being served, right? So we can get to all three components because we have these two given to us. Mm -hmm. We can get to the, we are given the total, we're given the waiting, and so therefore we can figure the processing, okay? All right, so then um, the total hourly cost of service and waiting, okay? So now has everybody gotten the 66%, 3.8, 1.28 written down? Okay, then I'm going to come back over here. And the purport, okay, so we're going to go... Um, the total hourly cost of service and waiting... So I'm going to come here and I'm going to go, I know that when I think about that, I need to know labor. 
I need to know equipment costs, right? I need to know cost of waiting, and I need a cost of blocking, okay? And we know that in an infinite system, the cost of blocking isn't applicable, right? Because everybody can get into the system, okay? And what we know about labor is that it tells us in the problem that they're paid $30 per hour. And how many laborers do we have? So it's a $30 fee for the labor, okay? Um, it tells us in the problem that the telephone company charges $10 per hour for the 800 line. And so we just, that's just a $10 per hour. And so a total charge of 10, because we're not talking about a cost per line here. We're just talking about the total cost of the system. And I'll try to make sure that that's clear on the, on the problem that's listed, okay? And so then our cost of waiting, right? If we um, think about that, it's our cost per time times our average time for someone to wait, right? And so our cost of waiting, if we come back up to the problem, the company estimates that each minute a customer is kept on hold, it costs $4 in customer dissatisfaction. So I'm going to take $4, and what am I going to multiply it times? 1.28. I'm sorry. So 1.28. 1.28, right? Because that's how many customers that we have on hold. Okay. But what's wrong? So I should, I need to be clear. This is $4 per minute. And what are these charges in? Four. Hours. So I need to convert this to hours as well. So then I'm going to multiply that times 60 minutes per hour. And that's going to give me a total cost of, I believe, my, I got a little bit of a scribble, but I think it's $288 per hour for waiting. Okay. And so then I need to add these three together, the 30, the 10, and the 288, to be able to answer the question. The total cost then is $328 per hour. Okay, use units of measure, make sure that they're matching, right? And then, um, because, you know, we can calculate in minutes, but if we're costing in hours, we've got to convert uh, to hours. Um, and show me your work, right? Because I'll give you partial credit if you show me how you got there. And for the online students, that goes for you as well. You need to go ahead and type your work into the, um, the essay part of the the problem because if you do that I can give you partial credit if you don't do that you either get all or nothing so uh, make sure that you're showing me how you got there <clears throat> all right then it says in comparison let's suppose that our catalog retailer has five telephone lines at most four callers can be kept on hold assume too that any caller who gets a busy signal because all five lines are occupied simply hangs up and calls a competitor our retailer's average loss in terms of current and potential future business is $150 per frustrated caller. Estimate the total hourly cost of the following. Okay, so in terms of providing service, right? Again, I typically um, think of it in terms of labor. Providing service includes both the labor and the equipment. When I'm doing a problem like this, I always lay out the four categories and make sure that I have covered the labor cost, the equipment cost, the waiting cost, and the blocking cost. Mm -hmm. And if they're not applicable, then I just put NA because they don't apply to this particular problem. Okay. Our labor costs in this case, um, now we're going to say, still $30 per hour for the person, right? And it's going to be plus, then now we're going to take those five lines times $10 per line, which is going to make that be a total cost of uh, $80 for the service, okay? But I have to go back to our copy of performance.xls because am I still in the infinite or am I in the finite? Finite. So I have to move over to the finite, 
right? And so I have to say that we still have um, one server. Okay, based on that, I think, Troy, we're back up to you. Um, so, ba And I know I should have asked you as we were reading through it, but it says at most four callers can be kept on hold. We have five total lines. What's my K? Four. Mm -hmm, because I can have four people on hold. I'm going to enter my 0.33 for my arrival rate and my 0.5 for my service rate, right? And then that's going to give me some, some other information here, right? And so if I look at the average number waiting in queue is 0.771. The average time that they're waiting is 2.45 minutes, right? So again, everything's in minutes because what we entered up here was in minutes, okay? And our average utilization of our servers is 62.94%. Okay, and so we need to take that information and determine both our cost of waiting and our blocking cost. And if we look at the formulas that we have for that, the margin loss due to blocking is our cost per time times our inflow rate times our probability of being blocked. And if you look, you have two ways of getting there, right? You can take the inflow rate times the probability of being blocked right? Or you can actually, they do it for you here in the spreadsheet. So you can just pull the number directly from here, okay? So our average rate leaving the system without service is 0 0.01532, okay? And so, um, and then in terms of our formula for waiting time, it's cost per time times our average people waiting, okay? Well, our I sub I is 0.771. So I need to pull that off of, off of here as well, All right? So I'm going to go cost of waiting in this example is 0.771. And we said that um, it's 0.771 customers times $4 per minute. And again, we need to convert to hours, so times 60 minutes per hour, right? And when I finish that, I think that's going to be 185.04 per hour for our cost of waiting, okay? Our cost of blocking, again, is going to be, um, if I come back up here to the formula, cost per time times R sub I times P sub B. So we said that our cost per time for blocking is... $150 per frustrated caller. So it's going to be $150 per caller times, and we can get the R sub I uh, times P sub B of 0 0.01532 customers per minute And we also then need to convert that to hours times 60 minutes per hour, right? And so that should be 137.88. And so to get to the total cost, So remember, if I look on my copy of performance.xls, I can either get it by the R sub I times the P sub B, or it actually does that for me on the spreadsheet, R sub I times P sub B, okay? All right, and so then my total cost is going to be labor plus equipment plus waiting plus blocking, right? So that's going to be 30 plus 50, and you can shortcut that and do the 80 from our service up above or keep it separate, um, plus our weighting of 185.04 plus the 137.88, and at the end of the day, that should be 402.92, okay? All right, so what's the conceptual difference between infinite and finite capacity? Julie, you get an easy one. What's the conceptual difference between infinite and finite capacity?
Maybe it's not. <laughs> I just don't know what you're... So if I'm so when I go to use that spreadsheet, I have to pick, make a choice between infinite and finite. What's the fundamental decision there? Why, why do I pick one versus the other? Uh, I don't, whether I, there's people waiting or not. Right. Whether well or whether how many if there's a limit on how many people can be waiting at a time. Right. There you go. So the finite is there's a limit on how many people can wait, and the infinite says we assume as many people as possible can enter the system. Okay. All right. I should know better than to think one's easy at the end of the semester, right? Okay, um, and then the last one that we're going to do um, is, has to do with the CP and CPK. All right, and so what I think I'm going to do is I'm just going to open up an Excel spreadsheet and transfer some of the information to Excel, and we'll just do it in Excel. I'll do it in Excel. How's that? Um, um, can you post the like, Excel spreadsheet, like a picture of it, like you're going to post on the exam, so like, when we go over practice these? Yeah. Mm-hmm. And if I don't have that up by tomorrow morning, send me an email and remind me. Okay. All right. Um, so we want to do um, consider a machine producing drive shafts with a mean diameter of six centimeters and a standard deviation of 0.01 centimeters. Mm -hmm. So to see if the process is in control, we take samples of size 10 and evaluate the average diameter over the entire sample. Customer specs require drive shafts to be between 5.98 and 6.02 centimeters. So the first thing it says is establish upper control and lower control limits of the process using uh, standard deviation Z of 3 sigma. Okay? So if I do the upper control and lower control, again, this is internal, right? So the formula for that is X double bar plus Z times the standard deviation of the sample divided by the square root of n. Okay? And that's the upper control limit. And the lower control limit is the exact same thing, just it has a minus instead of a plus. So, what I know is that X double bar, the average of the averages from the information that we're given, is 6 centimeters. I know that my Z score is 3, because we want to do three stand plus or minus 3 standard deviations, right? And I know that my standard deviation of the sample is 0.01. Okay. And I know that n is 10 because we're taking samples of size 10. So that's how many observations are in that sample. Okay. So now I'm just going to then fill this out. I'm going to go x double bar 6 plus 3 times the standard deviation of the sample, 0.01, right, divided by the square root of n. So I get 6.009. And then I'm going to do the same thing. I'm going to go 6 minus z times the standard deviation of the sample divided by the square root of n or 10. So kind of the key thing there is to make sure that you are able to identify the mean of the process, what your z-score needs to be, what the standard deviation of the sample is, and what n is, and then it becomes a plug and play because you've got the formulas, right? Um, So I say you've got the formulas, and then I need to go back and look at the exam and make sure I've given you the formulas. And if I haven't, I'll create a formula sheet to hand out and do the same thing for the students online. Okay? All right. With you? Hmm? Yes. Okay. Yeah? Well, I don't have this question in my review sheet. You don't? No. <laughs> Is it on the back page? 
Yeah. No, it's not. But the last thing I have, 8.4. Okay. Here. It's a little hard to do this question. Yeah. <laughs> you can. Uh -huh. you yeah. Just, yeah, you can get that. I don't have this question. All right. So we've established the control limits. And um, then we need to determine CP and CPK, right? And so CP, so this is what we learned today, right, is the upper specification limit minus the lower specification limit divided by 6 times the standard deviation, or 6 times sigma, right? Okay, so what I know is from reading the problem, the upper specification limit for the customer, what is the upper specification limit for the customer? I think Miranda were to you. Um, 6.02. Correct. Abby, what's the lower specification limit from the customer? 5.98. There we go, 5.98. So then to get CP, I'm going to take the upper spec minus the lower spec, right? And divide that by 6 times, and I need to do my parentheses right here, 6 times the standard deviation of the process, which is 0.01, right? So again, on the upper, I have the voice of the customer on the top and the voice of the process on the bottom. And unfortunately, it comes back that the voice of the process is larger than the voice of the customer, meaning that my specs are outside what the customer wants to see, okay? But for an exercise, I also want us to go ahead and calculate CPK. And CPK is the minimum, right, this is where we're breaking it apart, of the upper specification limit minus the mean divided by 3 times sigma. And it, actually, I need to put little extra parentheses in here. Because if I'm doing a, an Excel, I need to make sure that I keep the numerator as one term and the denominator as one term. I need to make that clear to both students here and students online. Okay? Right? Or, right, the mean minus the lower specification limit divided by 3 times sigma. Right? And um, I think in this one, I'm going to actually change the, um, change the mean as we do this. So the mean of the process, instead of being 6, is going to be, let's do 5.95, okay? And so when we calculate that, it's going to then become... Uh, the upper specification limit of 6.02 minus the mean of 5.95 divided by 3 times 0 0.01 and then conversely it'll be the mean of 5.95 minus the lower specification limit of 5.98, that was a bad choice, but that's okay, we're going to keep going with it, divided by 3 times 0 0.01. We should already know it's not going to work, right, because the mean is below the lower specification limit. All right, and so that being said, I wrote those out so you could see them. Now I'll actually calculate them. This is going to be 6.02 minus 5.95 divided by 3 times 0 0.01. should be 2.33 is equal to 5.95 minus 5.98 divided by 3 times 0 0.01. Negative one, huh? Guess that's not going to work for us, is it? 
All right. So that tells us that we're very capable on the upper side of it, but not at all capable on the lower side of it, right? And I changed that. The reason I changed the mean is because the way I had originally written the problem is the mean exactly matched, and so you weren't going to get anything different um, because the mean exactly matched, and so we weren't going to be able to show that difference. Um, do you understand what I'm saying by that? So the mean of the process was 6, and the mean of the specification limits was 6. So we really only needed to do CP, right? So I wanted to make the mean of the process be different so that we could show that CPK would have two different values. And so what we would say is then, so if I asked you, based on this information, what's CPK? What's your answer going to be? What's that? Negative 1, because it's the minimum of the two, okay? And the actual problem on the exam is written just slightly better than that, so it won't look quite so will crazy. It, will it give us the mean on the actual? Because this is like, you gave us x double bar, so that's the average of the averages. Mm -hmm. So are you going to give us that and the mean? or They're the same. x okay. double bar is the, is the mean of the process. Okay. Okay. Yeah. So yeah, should be fine. Um, and again, you'll have a chance you're going to work your a couple of problems. Um, I think it should not be, I'm hopeful this is not going to be a stressful test for you because the, the problems themselves are going to be very similar to this. And then you get the uh, multiple choice. Make sure you understand the terminology. You should be in good shape. You know, it's just making sure this stuff makes sense to you, the understanding why and the background of what variability does to waiting time and what um, and what combining that variability up does, what adding lines and what decreasing lines does. Okay, so make sure you walk through those. We did some of those in class, and I think you had some of those as a homework problem, so I just review those and make sure you're comfortable with them. All right, are we done? I think we're done. I think you guys are ready to be done, that's what I think. So, all right, you guys have a good couple of days. I'll see you back here on Thursday.